You're tuned into the COVID-19 Community Report here on KDRT 95.7 FM in Davis, California. I'm your host, Autumn Labe Renault, and today is Friday, April 10th. We're sharing local news and resources focusing on what's impacting Davis and nearby cities in Yolo County during the COVID-19 pandem- pandemic. Today is the one-month mark of doing this show twice a week live. My guests today are Yolo County Supervisor for District 4, Jim Provenza, and Davis Mayor, Brett Lee. This show airs live at noon on Tuesdays and Fridays and repeats at 5 p.m. both days and at noon on Sundays. And you can also listen online at kdrt.org. So I typically use this portion of the show to highlight a whole bunch of community resources, but today I've decided to highlight resources available through this nonprofit, the one I run, Davis Media Access, or DMA. In particular, I want to talk for just a minute about a community diary project we're doing here at DMA and KDRT. For every important moment or movement in this country, historians look not only at events, but at how people responded to them. So letters and diaries and other forms of informal documentation do as much to shape the record of an event as the event itself. In this spirit, DMA has launched a project called Life in the Time of COVID, Yolo County Community Diary, and we invite you, yes, all of you, to help document the history we're making during the COVID-19 pandemic by participating in a collaborative virtual storytelling project here in Yolo County. We launched the project last week and it will remain open until further notice. My take on this is as follows. What we experience as individuals adds to a greater understanding of the crisis we're weathering as a whole. And so I hope you'll join us. Using your cell phone, you're invited to record and upload a brief video, and we do recommend 90 seconds or less that describes some aspect of your experience. So what's it like to work from home or to homeschool your children? How is your business or nonprofit adjusting? How are you reshaping your creative expression? How are you struggling and and maybe who's helping you? And what places in Yolo County are soothing your socially distanced soul? These videos can be serious, humorous, informative. They can just be a video of a beautiful place. So it's quick, easy, free, and open to anyone in Yolo County. And the more people participate, the better the story we can tell. So please go visit davismedia.org slash diary to upload. And DMA will aggregate the videos into small theme collections such as business, schools, the environment, nonprofits, etc. And uh, we'll host them on YouTube. Our, the segments may also air on DCTV or KDRT. And each week we'll highlight particular collections on social media. And I also want to share that effective this week, DMA staff will offer technical assistance by email. You can email info at davismedia.org on Mondays between noon and 6 or Tuesdays and Thursdays between 9 a.m. and six and 3 p.m. and a staff member will get back to you. And also in the work, short webinars on helpful topics such as using Zoom for meetings and events, getting good audio, using remote technology, and more. There's actually a lot more coming down the pipe. I'll share more soon. And finally, after holding down the KDRT fort these past, this past month, I'm delighted to share that KDRT programmers are beginning to return to the airwaves. While they still can't come in and use the studio, our staff has been helping many of them produce fresh content remotely using a variety of tools. Visit KDRT org for the schedule, but welcome back so far to A Constant Grin, Davis Garden Show, High Country Music, Jazz After Dark, Meraki Radio, and Music Connections, and there will be many more to come. And we've, uh, speaking for myself, I've missed you all. There's much more in development, as I said, but this is what I can share today. And one more note before we take our first call, and that's that the Big Day of Giving is coming up May 7th. Normally this month, I'd be deep in planning for Big Day at the Dock, the huge community event that DMA developed five years ago and has staged in partnership with the Davis Live Music Collective, the Davis Phoenix Coalition, and Sudwork Brewing Company, among others. And while we simply can't do the event this year, many nonprofits, including Davis Media Access, including our upstairs neighbors, Cool Davis and Tree Davis, uh, will, will be looking for community support on May 7th. And we hope that those who can will support. You can learn more at bigdayofgiving.org. Let's take a moment for music before our first call. 
We're back, Hello. and we're back, and we're going to be welcoming a call from Yellow County Supervisor for District 4, Jim Provenza. He's seeking his fourth term as supervisor and faces a runoff election with challenger Linda Dios in November. Meanwhile, he's busy making things happen at the county. Hi, Jim. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me on. Sure. I've uh, interviewed quite a few people from various county departments over the past month, with oversight of everything from courts to property tax collections, the county's workload must be staggering. So what are some of the things you're working on right now? Well, I've been working uh, very hard on the uh, uh, with the Yellow Community Foundation on the uh, uh, COVID-19 Relief Fund. It's mm-hmm. a joint project between the county and uh, the Community uh, Foundation, and we're working there with uh, Yocha Dihi. Uh, the major hospital systems, uh, and it looks like we'll be working with a number of businesses as well. Right. So let's talk about this fund and the the intent behind it. I, I think you know that some of us were talking on Facebook, some of us uh, nonprofit leaders a few weeks ago, about uh, kind of the lack of support for, for nonprofits in this situation, and then the news about this fund came out. So great timing there. Yes, and... and- in fact, that's that's one of the purposes of the fund is to uh, help the existing nonprofits in two ways. Uh, one is is to uh, have a system of uh, of giving grants to to nonprofits where they are in particular hardship or have a particular need because of the COVID nineteen crisis, mm-hmm. but also to provide technical assistance and assistance uh, in, for example, uh, uh, seeking uh, the loans from the uh, federal government, which are available for nonprofits mm-hmm. and uh, navigating through what, what is a really complex uh, system to uh, get what help is available out there. Right. So tell me about uh, the the scope of the fund. I, I know that the County Board of Supervisors seeded it, but, but what are you envisioning in terms of how big the fund will get and, and who are some of the other participants that you can talk about at this point? Well, we were hoping to get to a million uh, mm-hmm. dollars fairly soon. Uh, we ha- the county put in two hundred and fifty thousand. The city of Davis just put in fifty thousand, and uh, we are you know active. We will be actively seeking large donations. Uh, we're not. We're intentionally not competing with existing uh, foundations. We don't want to do anything that would affect uh, uh, existing nonprofits' ability to raise funds. So we are are, are going to. Uh, to donors who who might be willing to donate large amounts to deal with the total crisis, mm-hmm. and and not be the regular donors of the uh, of the other nonprofits. So, we are working to get the cities on board. Uh, the city of Davis, of course, has said that they're on board, and the other cities are are considering it uh, probably next week. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're uh, and of course the uh, Yocha he is uh, is uh, part of this effort, and uh, we're asking for assistance from them. We will have a, uh, a steering committee with us at the staff level mm-hmm. to uh, help develop uh, the grant system. The elected officials will serve on a uh, re- really what is considered an advisory committee to identify needs in the community. Uh, it's really gaps and holes that aren't covered anywhere else. Mm-hmm. And then we'll have some uh, another committee with retired elected officials and business and other community leaders uh, to uh, help with the fundraising. So we will be releasing an action plan uh, next week Okay, that will detail all this. I've also been working with the Travis Credit Unions uh, Foundation. Uh, they are going to announce uh, uh, their grant. I believe it's something like a million dollars with another four million in uh, uh, matching grants, and they asked me to to identify needs in our community. So I have been working very hard to make sure that they know about the needs in our county. They, of course, cover a five county area, mm-hmm. and their grants will be going to the five county area. But they were particularly interested in making sure that Yolo County was covered in that process. 
That's good news. We have an extraordinary number of nonprofits in this county. I think I heard a, a figure of somewhere around 1,600. And, and, of course, they range in all sizes from operated by a single person to, to quite large. But all of us are facing similar challenges that are our normal events, including fundraisers and you know awareness raisers, are shut down. Um, we're concerned about our donors who have taken individual financial hits and may not be able to support in the same way. So so first, thank you for uh, you and the Board of Supervisors for um, this work that is going on. I have gotten a couple of questions from people who knew I'd be talking to you today. today. And one of them was, I know you said you, you don't want to hit individual donors who typically contribute to nonprofits, but my question is, will individuals, if they are moved, be, be able to contribute to this fund, or is this strictly a government and large business funded opportunity? No, I- individuals will, and there'll be a button on the, on the web page to, to donate, mm-hmm. but we're not seeking out the smaller donations. Uh, we're, we're, in fact, helping the existing nonprofits to pursue them and to come up with strategies, as you say, if if their traditional donors can't give, or what's a strategy for getting money elsewhere? What's when you can't do a live fundraiser? Right. How do you do a virtual fundraiser? How do you convince people that they should still be giving when there isn't a particular event to go to? And or, or can we do uh, virtual events with a Zoom uh, a Zoom event? There's lots of uh, of, uh, of alternatives, and and I think that we can by getting everyone together and and combining. The, the knowledge can come up with some approaches that, that may be quite effective. Right. Will the site and the ways in, uh, the way for nonprofits to apply will that be hosted on the on yellowcounty.org um, or will it be a separate site? I, I, the, I think it will be on uh, the uh, Yellow Community Foundation okay. site, and there'll be links from the uh, Yellow site. The the grants are expected to range between five thousand and thirty thousand dollars. Uh, with the ability of a nonprofit to come back for an additional grant as the needs arise. And the um, the goal is to be able to get the money out there, make a decision within two to four weeks of an application. Okay. And when will applications open? Um, we're going to publish the, the, the uh, action plan next week, and then we should be able to announce that. But I'm not certain of the exact date, but it's going to be fairly soon. Okay. When you make that public, I'll be sure to, uh, to share it here on the show, too. Great. So, um, and we will be talking about this at our board meeting on Tuesday. Okay, and you're you're also managing remote meetings. Um, are you using Zoom for that? We are. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it's uh, I've joked that it, it's a challenge for the for the boomers to to get on board with <laughs> that. It's the first time I'd ever done one, but but actually, I I find it it's it's uh, fairly uh, simple. Yeah. Uh, we, we, one of the things that was an issue for us is uh, we kept telling people, well hit the raise hand button, and what we needed to say was there's a button before that that you have to push. You have to push <laughs> the button that says participants first. And, you know, I, I just uh, attribute that to boomerism, uh, but we're, we've, we've, we're fixing that. <laughs> well, I think we're all learning new ways to do things right now. Uh, try running a, a community media organization remotely. It's been fun. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, what other things? We have just a couple of minutes. So, what other kinds of, of concerns are really coming through from your constituents? Anything you'd like to highlight? Well, there, you know, there's been a lot of questions because the, you know, the order sometimes it, it, it's it's fairly general, and and there's a a lot of questions as to how it applies in particular situations. Like one of the things that came up was, well, what about a a business that it isn't an essential. Uh, function, but all they're doing is delivering. Uh, like, for example, Australitia's uh, Flowers was delivering, and their question was, can we continue to deliver? And we, we posed that question uh, to uh, to our staff, to uh, our health officer. Mm-hmm. And w- one of the issues there was, well, well you know, uh, uh, the big companies uh, can are doing that. They're, they're delivering. They've, they've been doing it, uh, whether it's, uh, whether it's uh, Costco or um, uh, Amazon, mm-hmm. they're delivering items. So why would we why would we exclude our local businesses from that? And mm-hmm. so the answer came back was no. The local businesses can continue to do that if they observe all of the distancing and all of the uh, protections that would normally apply, and they're leaving the 
the items outside of someone's door. They're not approaching the door to talk to people. They're, they're just calling and saying, hey, your item is there. Come out and get it. Mm-hmm. And so that was, that's a type of thing that, uh, you know, the board members have been able to field those types of questions. Other things, questions come in, and uh, we realize there's nothing we can do about it, although it's, it's inconvenient because we're, we're trying to make sure that people don't congregate and that large groups of people aren't together. So uh, some of the things we've had to say no to. But uh, overall, I, I think uh, the board members have been able to, uh, through being in close touch with uh, constituents, been able to deal with those uh, issues. Uh, another that came up was, uh, what about uh, notarizing documents? Like somebody mm. is doing their will or their trust and it didn't go through before the, the current crisis. And obviously, at a time like this, people want those things to be completed and um, sure. came up with a... I worked with a notary to come up with a procedure of having a, uh, a table outside the outside the office and, and no one to approach at the same time and everybody everything to be wiped down afterwards. So there's there's ways to do things uh, within the rules that uh, that keep our ongoing uh, essential operations going. And so that that I think has been a role of all the board members and county staff as as well as the health officer. And then of course. We pose questions as they come up while trying not to uh, pose too many questions because they have such essential work to do. Sure. Okay, what's the best way for people to reach you, your constituents to reach you if they have questions? Well, they can uh, send me an email at uh, jprovenza at yolocounty.org, or they can uh, text or call me at my cell phone, which is 530-601-601. Seven eight four three. Great. Well, we appreciate your work, especially on the nonprofit front, and um, and and your accessibility to making your, you know yourself available by cell and email. Thanks for calling in today, and uh, let, let's have you back down the road to see how the how the fund is developing and and how that's going. Sure, I'd be happy to. All do right. That. Thank Thanks you. so much. Okay. Bye. That was Supervisor Jim Provenza. He represents the 4th District in Yolo County. We're going to hear a little bit of music as we get set up for our next call. Okay, for our our next call, Davis Mayor Brett Lee has been a frequent guest on shows here at DMA over the years. And he's here today to talk about the city's response to the COVID-19 virus. Welcome, Brett. Uh, Thanks, Autumn. Um, How are you doing? How are you and your family keeping? Uh, we're doing well. Um, you know, as you know, I have a 11 year old son and, uh, um, normally this would be spring break. And so, um, but, uh, spring break without the travel, uh, <laughs> but the past few weeks have uh, been kind of interesting. We've, uh, been doing some online, uh, exercises and actually just, uh, spending a little more time together than yeah. normal, which, uh, is a good thing. Yeah. There, there is an upside to some of that, right? <laughs> yeah. So the Davis City Council's meeting uh, this Tuesday was all about the COVID response, and I'm hoping you'll share with us a few of the key takeaways from the meeting. Yeah, I would say um, we started out the meeting by having uh, Dr. Ron Chapman from the Yolo County Department of Public Health uh, give us an update on the situation. And um, I, I would say that we're very fortunate in Davis to have the county Um, having a well-staffed and professional public health department and the cities within Yolo County are following the lead and guidance of the county Mm -hmm. and so we're all kind of on the same page working together in a coherent plan so I think it's important that you know Davis Woodland West Sac you know we're all on the same page I mean it would be kind of silly or counterproductive if one city did one thing and another city did another. Sure. So we're, uh, you know, the, the county has been very instrumental in that, helping us have a, a cohesive, comprehensive, science-based plan. And so the, the county's uh, really updated us. And, uh, you know, the latest thing that we've seen uh, in the past, uh, call it a few days, not quite a week, is this um, change in view from the CDC on the use of uh, uh, face coverings. Right. And so uh, Dr. Chapman talked to us a little bit about that. And it's kind of a a nuanced instruction. And so I I think many people found that informative. Just for the listeners who may not have uh, heard, 
the meeting, essentially the, the idea is uh, masks or N95 masks should be reserved for the people on the front lines uh, dealing with the coronavirus situation, for instance, uh, medical personnel or fire folks, things like that, where it's essential that they have these masks. And because of a, a variety of reasons, those masks are in short supply. And so what the public is being asked to do is um, the, make use of face coverings, mm -hmm. which are different. These are sort of more of a cloth-like material, which is mainly designed to prevent the transmission from the wearer to others. So the idea is it is sort of a, uh, a fabric that prevents you, like if you were to sneeze, it, your, mm -hmm. the, the water droplets don't spray all over the place. It really just contains that. And so the face coverings are meant to protect others not necessarily uh, to protect yourself. Right, and we're starting to see that uh, here in, in Davis, businesses such as, I, I know, Nugget Markets will be mandating that their shoppers wear face coverings beginning uh, next Monday. So Yeah, yeah, and so that's a, a good thing in that yeah. the science is showing that this would be a way to reduce transmission. So right. you can imagine, I, I think, you know, the people on the front line, when you think about it, you definitely have to include uh, the supermarket checkers. There are hundreds of people go through their lines every day, and uh, yeah. we've, many of the markets have taken some ste steps to protect them. But that additional protection of requiring um, shoppers to wear um, face coverings, uh, I think, is a, a positive. Mm -hmm. So I was just talking with uh, Jim Provenza, county supervisor, about the uh, relief fund for nonprofits, and I know the city took some action there on Tuesday. Yes, we've uh, set aside uh, fifty thousand dollars to join in with uh, our other uh, uh, partners at the various cities in Yellow County and the county itself to create a fund to help some of the nonprofits that are are going through some struggles. And the idea here is rather than have to deal with all the individual uh, requests on a piecemeal basis, we would have a better, more comprehensive uh, approach to this by partnering with other cities and the county to create a fund, mm -hmm. and there would be sort of a centralized point for nonprofits to reach out to. So it simplifies their efforts, and it just makes it easier to evaluate the requests. Yes, speaking as a as someone who runs a nonprofit, we appreciate this very much. Did the city does the city have a point person for that particular effort? Um, I'm sure we do, but the <laughs> name is not uh, springing to mind. Okay. Um, we have uh, there's an emergency operations uh, control group, and the tasks are divided amongst many individuals. The person taking the lead on that is Darren Pytel. Okay. And uh, most of the city manager's staff, is, they're actively involved with that. So, okay. Um, and um, I understand you'll be writing a letter to Congressman Garamendi about additional economic stimulus. I, I, when I interviewed him last week, we, we talked about the, the kinds of hits that city and county governments will be taking due to the crisis. Yeah. So one of the things that um, the... The relief efforts that have been sponsored by the federal government are very much appreciated. One of the things they did is they set aside money for cities uh, to help deal with the crisis, but what they did is they limited that aid to cities uh, of populations 500,000 or greater. Obviously, uh, Davis is not 500,000, uh, you know, sure. it's definitely well under 500,000 people. And so our hope is that the next round of federal support will acknowledge the fact that there are many, many, many smaller municipalities that are uh, having substantial financial challenges. And this, um, this, this idea of only cities above $500,000 being eligible for some of these uh, grants and uh, disbursements um, doesn't make a lot of sense. And, you know, out of the gate, uh, Congress you know, did their best to cover most bases. Certainly, yeah. Uh, but, you know, now we've had a little more time to look and see what was passed. And, yeah, we definitely do want to make sure that there are resources for the city of Davis as well as, as, well as other cities like ourselves.
Right. Brett, I want to thank you for coming on. We're actually running out of time, and I didn't get to half the things I would like to chat with you about, so we'll need to have you back, too. But okay. thank you. Well, I just want to express my appreciation to the public of Davis. Uh, I think uh, we're doing a very good job with social distancing, and I remain optimistic that our city will carry on. And I'm happy to come back anytime, uh, Adam. I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you today. Thanks so much for your leadership. Take care.